shepherds and the angels from Luke chapter 2, verse 8 to 20. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and laying in a manger. And suddenly there, were, there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds had told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. Beloved, what wondrous news. And in light of that, let us go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, we thank you that we can celebrate this great news of a Savior who has come into the world and has taken on the sins of His people and has died as a substitute for them. Father, we pray that you would delight to be with us this morning, teaching us, admonishing us, and encouraging our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. He sent his son to save us. Let us sing praises to our God. Oh, come, all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant. Oh, come, ye, oh, come, ye to Bethlehem. Come and behold him, born the King of angels. Oh, come, let us adore. Oh, come, let us adore. 
ransom captive Israel. Then was in lonely exile here until the Son of God appeared. Oh, come thou days be. I 
is my highest and adore, Christ the everlasting Lord. Late in time, behold Him come, offspring of the virgin's womb. Veiled in flesh, the Godhead see, hailed incarnate deity. Jesus, man with man to dwell, Jesus, our Emmanuel, God the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn King. Hail the handborn born of peace, hail the Son of righteousness, light and life to all he brings, risen with healing in his wings. Might he lays his glory by, born that man no more may die, born to raise the sons of earth, born to second bird heart the herald angels sing glory to the newborn king heart the herald angels sing glory to the newborn king praise the Lord you may be seated Good morning, Church. My name is Matilda. I am from Indonesia. It is my privilege to read the Bible to you today. Matthew 2, Matthew 2, verse 1 to 12. The visit of the wise men. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, Wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him, and assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people. He inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word, that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then, opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. Thank you. Merry Christmas, CCC. Uh, let's go to Lord in prayer. Father God, thank you. Thank you for being greater than Santa Claus. God, thank you that you 
are not up there making a list of who's naughty and who's nice. God, that we don't get what we deserve. God, because certainly we are all on the naughty list. Father, we are uh, weak. God, we are sinners. We rebel against you and you alone. Father, and you're merciful and loving. God, we, we don't get what we deserve because of you. God, we, we celebrate today. God, we don't just celebrate the birth of a child. This is not just a happy birthday for a cute baby. God, today we celebrate the incarnation. We celebrate that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. God, that the Savior has come, that you sent your Son into this world. God, that he lived a perfect life. He was the true human, the true man that was without sin, the way you intended humanity to be. God, that he didn't deserve death, but he went to the cross. God, he went to the cross for us, for those that will place their faith in him, God, that he paid the penalty of sin for us. He took on your wrath for our sins, God. God, and he died. And that he didn't stay dead. God, that three days later, he rose from the grave victoriously, defeating death. That he is alive today. God, we rejoice today that your son, Jesus Christ, came into this world. God, that he was a ransom for many. God, that you have reconciled us to you through him. That his righteousness has been imputed to us. What a merry, merry Christmas it is, God, to know that we are right with you, not because of anything that we've done, but because of him, Emmanuel, God with us. There is no fear of hell because of him and what he has done. Father, thank you for your mercy, for not giving us what we deserve, but instead giving us the gift of you. Father, I want to lift up Pastor Kurt to you as he comes. Father, I pray that you would speak to us through him. You would speak to us through your perfect word. God, work on us this morning. Turn our hearts to you. We thank you so much for your son, Jesus, and it's his name that I pray. Amen. Well, good morning, church. Merry Christmas to you all. It's always a joy on the years that we get to gather for our regular church meeting on Christmas Day. I think it would happen about one out of every seven years, if, if I understand how the calendar works correctly. And so it's great that this year we can be together on Christmas Day. You know, I like to put on my, my suit for Christmas. I saw even Cromwell's got his tie on, looking good. And uh, it's, it's great to be together on Christmas. Hard thing for the pastor on Christmas is really for my children, okay? So normally we would open presents first thing in the morning on Christmas morning, but I'm not going to let them open the presents without me. So they have to wait until after church, until after lunch. They're going to have to wait until this afternoon to open their presents. And most children, I know it's different in different cultures. Not all cultures do the Christmas presents, but I think many of you do. And for many of the children, opening presents is the most important thing of Christmas. It's the thing that they are most excited about. I remember when I was a child, the best present I remember receiving was when I opened up a box and there was a, a car racetrack that was just perfect. It shot two cars at once and they would go down the track 
And then the winner of the race, it would, it would have a light turn on to tell me which car was the fastest. And I just played with that car racetrack day after day for years. It's the best present I remember getting on, on a Christmas day. Now you can imagine, and kids, you can imagine this, if, if you grabbed a present and you tore the paper off, you open up the box, and inside that box is God. What? How would that be possible? What? what how, how, could, how could God be in a box? How could God be a, a, something we, we hold in our hands? I mean, what would you do if, if, if whatever this, this, this is that's God, I mean, you... I'd be terrified. I'd like, you want to worship God. And here's God. You can touch him and see him. It's kind of crazy to think about. That's hard to imagine. It even feels a little bit blasphemous to imagine something like that. And yet, that's kind of what happened for Mary and Joseph. Mary didn't open up a box. She went through a painful labor of having a child. But when all was said and done, she was holding God in the flesh, in her arms, wrapping up God the Son in swaddling clothes. That is hard to imagine. We cannot hold God in our hands today. Jesus is not with us in the flesh today. That was 2,000 years ago. But I want to ask you today, is God with us? Is God with us today? Is God with you today? We just sang one of my favorite Christmas songs, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. I love that Christmas song because that theme of Emmanuel is directly from the Bible. And Emmanuel means God with us. Emmanuel is the reason for the season. Emmanuel is the reason we are here this morning to worship the God who is with us. So for the rest of our time this morning, I want to actually look at this theme of Emmanuel, God with us, through the whole Bible and show you how central this is to the message of God, how it goes from Genesis to Revelation, and then to challenge you that for some of you this morning, God is with you. He is with you, and you are enjoying a relationship with Him. You are talking with Him. You are rejoicing in Him, and that's great. For some of you, God is with you. You're a Christian, but most of your life you act like He's not with you. You don't talk to him much at all. You look just like most other people in the world. And then maybe for some of you, God is not with you. And maybe today is a day that that can change. So let's look at this theme throughout the Bible. We're going to start with some Old Testament passages. In fact, we're going to start right at the beginning with Genesis chapter 3. The first book of the Bible the book of Genesis, and look at what we see in Genesis chapter 3. And they, that's Adam and Eve, heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. This is after God created the universe. He created everything. He created the Garden of Eden. He created Adam and Eve. He put them in the garden. And it says, the Lord God was walking in the garden. The Lord God was with them in this perfect place, this perfect state. God is with Adam and Eve in the garden. The theme of Emmanuel is present in the Bible from the very beginning in the book of Genesis. What a beautiful picture of Adam and Eve with God in the garden. Well, we move forward to the book of Exodus And don't worry, I'm not going to go through every book of the Old Testament. But Exodus is the second book of the Old Testament, the second book of the Bible. It's the great story of God saving his people out of slavery in Egypt. And in Exodus, you read about the ten plagues on Pharaoh and Moses bringing his people out of Egypt. And as Moses and the Israelites are running from Egypt, we see this passage in Exodus 13, 21 
and 22. It says, And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them along the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, that they might travel by day and by night. The pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night did not depart from before the people. So these helpless slaves running out of Egypt have God with them. The pillar of cloud by day, the pillar of fire by night. Day and night, God is with them. This theme of Emmanuel is present here in Exodus with the Israelites of God with his people. And this is right before Moses parts the Red Sea by the power of God. He is with them. You move forward in the Old Testament and we come to perhaps the pinnacle of Old Testament history and the greatest symbol of God's presence with his people in the Old Testament. Do you know what it is? It's the temple, the temple of God in Jerusalem. So after Exodus, God establishes his people in the land. They're in Israel. They build the capital city of Jerusalem. And then Solomon builds the temple of God. And look at what it says about the temple in 1 Kings chapter 8. 1 Kings 8, when the temple is being dedicated to the Lord, it says, And when the priests came out of the holy place, a cloud filled the house of the Lord, so that the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud. For the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. Then Solomon said, The Lord has said that he would dwell in thick darkness. I have indeed built you an exalted house, a place for you to dwell in forever. This temple in Jerusalem is where the presence of God dwelled with the people of God. They brought the Ark of the Covenant into the Holy of Holies in the temple. It was the holiest place on earth. It's where the presence of God dwelled. The theme of Emmanuel is present and clear. God was with his people in the Old Testament. Genesis, Exodus, 1 Kings, on and on and on. God is with his people. And God longs to dwell with his people. Now this is a rosy picture of the Old Testament. The verses I just showed you made it look like everything was great and glorious in the Old Testament. What could possibly go wrong? They have the presence of God with them. God is dwelling with them. What could possibly go wrong? Well, let's go back and look at Genesis 3 again. In the same verse I showed you earlier, Genesis 3, 8, the next part says, And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. God is with them, walking with them, and they're hiding? Why would they be hiding from him? This great and glorious God who created them is walking with them, and they're they're hiding in the trees, as if you can hide from God. Well, the reason they are hiding from him is that they disobeyed God. The one rule that God gave them, to not eat from one tree, And they disobeyed that. And we see right there in the beginning that sin is separating people from God. Adam and Eve had the presence of God with them, but their sin separated them from God. In their shame and in their guilt, they were hiding from God. They couldn't handle the presence of God anymore. And eventually God cast them out of the garden and they're separated from him. You move forward to Exodus, where the pillar of fire and the pillar of cloud are guiding the people of Israel. But what happens next? Just a few chapters later, in Exodus 16, look at what the Israelites are doing. They set out from Elam, and all the congregation of the people of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai, on the 15th day of the second month after they had departed from the land of Egypt. So about a month and a half later, 15th day of the second month since they left. And the whole congregation of the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. 
And the people of Israel said to them, Would that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the meat pots and ate bread to the full. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Just a month and a half after the miraculous rescue where God did amazing signs and wonders to bring Israel out of Egypt. He parted the Red Sea for them, and they saw it. Now they're grumbling about food. They have the presence of God with them, but they're more concerned about, well, we had more meat in Egypt, and they prefer to die. And from there, Israel's relationship with God only gets worse. Even in Exodus, they build a golden calf and worship that. They're losing the presence of God. And what happens with the temple? The temple, that great high point in Old Testament history. Well, after the temple was built, it's a slow fade away from the worship of God. Generation after generation rebels against God. Most of the kings of Israel and Judah worship idols. And the result of the story of the temple We see it at the end of 2 Kings. In 2 Kings 25, it says, In the fifth month, on the seventh day of the month, that was the 19th year of King Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, Nebuzaradan, the captain of the bodyguard, a servant of the king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem, and he burned the house of the Lord and the king's house and all the houses of Jerusalem. Every great house he burned down. The great temple of God burnt to the ground, destroyed. No more Holy of Holies, no more Ark of the Covenant. It was all destroyed or stolen by the Babylonians. Even in the book of Ezekiel, there's this tragic vision of the glory of the Lord rising up from the temple and departing from it because of the idol worship of the Israelites. No more Emmanuel, no more presence of God with Israel because of their sin. Brothers and sisters, I fear this is where many of you are today. You know, this year, 2020, has been so hard, so unpredictable for so many of us. Nobody, Nobody thought we'd be wearing masks at our Christmas Day service, and yet here we are. It's been a tough year. And many of you are thinking, is God still with me? I can remember times in the past where the presence of God was so strong in my life. But for some reason right now, he feels far away. He feels distant. It feels like the Babylonian army came in and and stole the presence of God from me. Or it feels like I'm, I'm hiding from him in the trees and I can't see him. Or maybe you've gotten so consumed with your circumstances like the Israelites in the wilderness complaining about food, and you've been so worried about your job and your family and your money and everything that you've forgotten that the presence of God is with you if you know Jesus. So it could be that the reason you're not experiencing God with you is there could be some sin in your life that you're not dealing with. Yes, it's been a hard year, but God has not changed. He is still with his people. And we will look at that more. But we need to consider the fall of Israel and recognize the dangers for us. Now, the good news for Israel is that the Old Testament story didn't end with the burning of the temple. The prophets come, and they continue speaking the word of the Lord. And we see this amazing prophecy in the book of Isaiah famous Christmas verse in Isaiah 7, 14. It says, therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. God was going to come back. God was going to appear to his people again. God was not done dwelling with his people because God longs to dwell with his people. 
And so we get to the New Testament. We get to the Christmas story. And the biggest passage I want to read today from Matthew chapter 1, where we see the meaning of the song, O come, O come, Emmanuel, become clear to us. Emmanuel comes in the most full and most amazing way. He comes as one of us. Look at this in Matthew 1, 18 to 25. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. The baby Jesus was God with us. The baby Jesus was fully God and fully human, just like us. This is the incarnation. It started with a miraculous conception, a virgin birth that shows Jesus is the son of God. He really is God with us. But then many of the details of this story show how ordinary and normal of a baby Jesus is. You know, sometimes we think of the Christmas story and we think of it as like this sweet, beautiful, perfect little moment with the manger and the animals. Like, like maybe we think Mary didn't have any pain in childbirth. I think she probably did because she was a human woman and she was giving birth to a real human baby and they didn't even have epidurals back then to help with the pain. So I imagine the birth of Jesus was hard for Mary. I imagine that Jesus cried as a baby. Why wouldn't he have cried? He's truly a human. Human babies cry. Jesus cried as an adult two times we see in the scripture. So why wouldn't he have cried as a baby? Because sometimes we sing these songs. There's one song, I actually disagree with this song that we sing at Christmas sometimes, Away in a Manger. You know that song, Away in a Manger? The little Lord Jesus, no crying he makes. I think he did cry. He's really a human. We like to think that Jesus just like shot out of Mary in some miraculous way and then the shepherds and the wise men come and we think maybe Jesus as this tiny little baby sits up in the manger and starts preaching to them. Hey guys, welcome. It's me, Jesus. No, he's really a baby. Just like you were really a baby. He's a baby. He's a human. He cried like other babies cried. He needed his mom and his dad to hold him and wrap him up in swaddling clothes. Imagine that, wrapping up God the Son in his clothes. He was really a baby. He was really a human. And this matters because it shows us the extent God was willing to go to be with his people. It shows us how much God loves his people how much he wants to dwell with us, that he would come in the flesh, God the Son, in the flesh as a human in order to be with us. And not just to live a life on earth with us 2,000 years ago, but in that text, it tells us why he came. He came to save his people from their sins, to save us from what happened in the garden with Adam and Eve and their sin. 
to save the Jews from their sins, to save the Gentiles from their sins, to save all who would believe in him from their sins. Because that's what was needed to bring God and man together. We can't have God with us while we are still sinners. We can't have a holy God with us unless our sins are taken care of and forgiven. And that's why God came. That's why Jesus came as a real human. And so we can't really talk about Christmas without talking about Good Friday as well. When this real human, Jesus Christ, hung on a cross and felt real pain, he had real human blood flowing out of his wrists and ankles. He had real lungs that were struggling to breathe on the cross. He cried out with a real pain and a real voice and said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? As he bore the wrath of God for our sins. And his real human heart stopped beating. And he died. Real God, real human, dying on the cross so that he could be with us and we could be with him so that our sins could be forgiven and that the promise of Emmanuel would be true forever for us. And so let me stop right here and ask you, is God with you? The only way to have God with you is through Jesus. If you don't know Jesus, if you've not trusted in Jesus as your Savior and turned from your sin and put your faith in him and what he did on that cross for you, then God is not with you. You are still a sinner, a rebel against God, and you do not have the presence of God with you. And that's why it's so important to us, important to me, to preach to you today the good news that Jesus did come to die for our sins. And you can put your faith in him today. And he will forgive your sins. And you will have the presence of God with you forever. So my friend, if this is your first time at church or you don't know Jesus, please, I urge you to, to turn to him today. Pray to him today. Put your faith in Jesus today. And his death will be the sacrificial death that paid for your sins. And God will be with you. And then brothers and sisters, for many of you, this is the 10th or the 20th or the 30th Christmas that you've celebrated. Or 50th as a Christian. Is God with you? If you know Jesus, then yes, he is. But let's start living like it. Why aren't we talking to him more? If God is really with us, why aren't we different from the world? Why are we still getting so filled with the anxieties of this life and this virus and all the things going on as if God is not with us, as if God is far away? He's with us. Look at 1 Corinthians 3.16. To prove this to you. You might be thinking, well, Jesus rose from the dead. He ascended. He's not with us. Well, do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? This is the church, the people of God, the Christians. We're the temple of God. We saw the temple in the Old Testament where God dwelled. Now we are the temple of God. God is with us by the Holy Spirit of God. The theme of Emmanuel continues for Christians through the Holy Spirit. He's really with us. But some of us are quenching him. Some of us go through days and weeks and months without even thinking about God with us. If you know Jesus, God is with you. So let's live like it. Let's talk with him. Let's enjoy him. Let's confess our sins to him when we fall into sin. We really do have God with us. I know it's been hard this year. I've had moments of feeling far from God this year. It's been a tough year, one of the craziest years of our lives. But God has not changed. Emmanuel is true for God's people. And his spirit is with us. 
Let us be reminded of that today on Christmas, that because Jesus came once, he gave us his spirit, and then he will come again. You know, the Holy Spirit being with us does not mean that life is easy and perfect. It hasn't been easy and perfect. But it does mean that he's with us for comfort, for guidance, for encouragement, for conviction, for help, no matter what is going on in our lives. If 2021 is worse than 2020, God is still with us. So we need not fear. And then the final step, the final chapter of the story of Emmanuel, we see in the final book of the Bible, Revelation. We started in Genesis, let's look at Revelation. When all of this will be made complete, when it will be finished, look at Revelation 21, 3 and 4. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more, neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. We still sing, O come, O come, Emmanuel. God's spirit is with us, but we are still waiting For Jesus to return, when Emmanuel will return and set all things right once and for all and will fully be in his kingdom and he will wipe every tear away from our eyes. This is the conclusion for all who know Jesus. God with us forever. No more tears, no more pain, no more sorrow, no more doubt, no more fear, No more uncertainty, no more COVID-19, no more cancer, no more job loss, no more war, no more death of loved ones, no more struggle with sin, no more relational conflict, no more loneliness, no more anxiety, no more depression, no more Satan, no more poverty, no more injustice, no more racism, no more evil forever. Because God will be with us forever. Praise be to God, Emmanuel, that he came on Christmas and that he will be with us forever and save us from this world. Let's pray. Father, we love you. Encourage our hearts today, Lord, with this whole story from the Bible that points us to Jesus and his coming. May our hearts be filled with your presence as we trust in you, Lord. May we truly be able to sing joy to the world from our hearts and be filled with the wonders of your love, O Lord. Fill us with the wonders of your love once again today. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Kurt. Would you stand with us? as we sing our closing songs. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive a King. sounding joy, repeat the sounding joy, repeat, repeat the sounding joy. No more
let sins and sorrows grow, nor thorns infest the ground. He comes to make his blessings flow, far as the curse is found, far as the curse is found, far as, far as the curse is found. He rules the world with truth and grace and makes the nations prove the glories of His righteousness and wonders of His love, and wonders of His love, and wonders, wonders of His love, and wonders, wonders. Christmas. You may be seated. Well, thank you, music team. I do want to say thank you to everyone that's helped uh, put these services together, uh, especially Cass and the TEC team. They're going to be here all day on Christmas Day to help all the different churches. So we're very thankful for them and their work to uh, serve us and to help us to... Uh, be able to have church together. So say thank you to them uh, if, if you get the chance. Also, I want to let you know, uh, Pastor Aubrey is not here today. He wishes he could be. He had a family emergency come up back in India. So he flew back to India earlier this week. So you can pray for him. Uh, he's, yeah, he's got a lot going on. So definitely be praying for him. Hopefully he'll be able to come back here soon. Um, speaking of Pastor Aubrey, I hope you've all seen the senior pastor 
uh, candidate announcement that Pastor Aubrey is our candidate. And so uh, there's a video that's been sent out. Hopefully you've seen that, but if you haven't, uh, please watch that video. And um, the next month, we're going to have a lot of opportunities for Q&A time with him so you can get to know him even more. So be uh, looking for those things as we uh, lead up to a vote probably at the end of January. Um, We do have a church-wide Zoom call in two weeks on January the 8th. So if you're a church member, we'd love for you to join us for this call. A big part of this call will be some time to ask Aubrey some questions and get to know him. And then we'll also be voting as a congregation on Pastor Wiley as the Ruiz Church Planter. Uh, We met him last week. We had a great time. Uh, I'm very thankful that God has brought him here. And so we're going to vote on him to officially be our Ruiz Church Planter and move that forward. So please join us for that call. Um, I believe that's it for announcements today. We have an offering box out there as you go. If you're new with us, please don't feel any obligation to give. That's not what we're about here. We just are glad that you're here. In fact, we'd love to connect with you more if this is your first time here. Uh, We have a link you can fill out and some contact details there, even a WhatsApp number. So mark that down or take a picture of that if you're new and you're interested in joining ECC, we'd love to connect with you in the weeks to come and to do that. Let's stand up for a benediction, and I hope that even as I read this benediction, we'll also remember the words of that last song, that as we are filled with the presence of God through His Spirit, we would go and tell others about that and spread the good news of Emmanuel, God with us. So from the end of the book of Jude, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. You may now sit down and we will dismiss you by sections.